Listen, we're going to be discussing a four-letter word, but it's probably not the one that you're thinking of. Uh, the word we'll be dealing with is something that is sometimes used to refer to our emotional, mental, or physical needs. This word is very negative. It can be short-lived or it can last a long time. It's called pain, and it's a really nasty four-letter word. The ability to sense pain is thanks to a process known as nociception. More technically, nociception is the ability to sense noxious stimuli that in and of themselves can hurt you. While you may hate being in pain, it's actually critical to your survival. Although proof for this is currently lacking for many different reasons, it's likely that anything that is able to actively escape a predator is able to sense pain. There would be little reason for something to actively move away from a source of potential harm other than the fear of pain, the fear of death, or both. The reason you should be grateful for pain lies well beyond just the evolutionary basics. For example, if you were burned by a hot stovetop and had no ability to sense pain, you'd uh, also be less likely to either notice the burn or care to do anything about it. Since the throbbing pain wouldn't be there to constantly warn you about the burn, you'd leave it alone since the stovetop isn't a predator out to kill you. However, this action or inaction, to be more precise, would still predispose your body to infection through the burn, which could then kill you. In essence, pain is your body's alarm system that ends up saving your life. In fact, a rare genetic condition where a person is unable to feel pain or react to it is known as congenital analgesia and can cause significant harm to a person unaware of serious, normally pain-inducing conditions that may be occurring in their body. Actually, in the movie The Girl Who Played With Fire and its sequel, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, that rare disorder accounted for why Elizabeth Salander's gigantic half-brother couldn't be hurt with any kick, throw, or taser gun. With that in mind, there are three major types of noxious stimuli to which people with congenital analgesia are unable to sense or react to. These include mechanical noxious stimuli such as pinching, tearing of the skin, and other physical deformations of the body's structures that result in pain. Thermal noxious stimuli, stimuli that cause pain through temperature extremes, and chemical noxious stimuli, chemically based irritants such as capsaicin that induce pain sensation. The nerves that sense noxious stimuli affecting the body are collectively known as nociceptors and individually are known by the type of stimulus they respond to. Therefore, we have chemical nociceptors, thermal nociceptors, mechanical nociceptors, and so forth. Once any sensory nerve, the nociceptor, senses some kind of noxious stimuli, it gets really excited and sends an electric signal to the spinal cord. At the spinal cord, the nociceptor meets or synapses with another nerve. At this junction, the nociceptor releases a neurotransmitter such as glutamate or substance P, which then, in turn, activates the nerve cell the nociceptor has synapsed with. It's easy to remember that substance P is involved in pain, since you can think of the P as representing the word pain. In any case, the nerve located in the spinal cord then sends a signal to the brain's thalamus, which among other things is a structure in the brain involved in relaying and processing pain sensation. From here, the signal travels to the brain's cerebral cortex, which is a higher order structure involved in everything from memory to awareness. The pain signal that travels to the brain may eventually cause the release of pleasure-producing neurotransmitters, such as endorphins, a type of opioid. These endorphins are released thanks to structures such as the pituitary gland and hypothalamus, the structure in the brain that is responsible for maintaining your body's homeostasis, or normal state of equilibrium. I like to think of the hypothalamus as Lady Justice. If she senses something is wrong or weighted too heavily to one side, she does something to the other side of the scale to even things out. In our case of pain, as soon as the brain signals to the hypothalamus that the body is in pain, it causes the release of opioids that produce pleasure and return the body's sensations back to normal.
Once these endorphins are released into the body, they land on their appropriate receptors. These receptors, in the case of opioids, are unsurprisingly known as opioid receptors. Once an opioid lands on its receptor, it essentially tells the body's nerves to calm down and stop firing off signals about the pain they are sensing. To be more specific, one way they do this is by inhibiting the release of substance P, one of the things that allows nerves to signal pain in the first place. This is how pain-relieving drugs, such as morphine, which in and of itself is an opioid, work to reduce pain in our body. Something to keep in mind is that with this description we've only barely scratched the surface of the complex nature of pain and the way by which it is controlled, sensed, and classified. For instance, pain doesn't have to be stimulated only by temperature, chemicals, or mechanical factors. We can also experience pain when nerves are damaged, we are shocked with electricity, our stomach hurts, or we are emotionally hurt. Yes, believe it or not, Many of the same things we learned about in this lesson are involved in emotional pain. Therefore, emotional pain isn't fake pain. It's just as real to your body neurologically and chemically speaking as pain caused by getting your fingers slammed in the door. I hope, at the very least, this lesson didn't cause you any undue pain and that you'll experience some pleasure reviewing everything with me one more time. Recall that the ability to sense pain is thanks to a process known as nociception. More technically, nociception is the ability to sense noxious stimuli that in and of themselves can hurt you. There are three major types of noxious stimuli to which people with congenital analgesia are unable to sense or react to. These include chemical, mechanical, and thermal noxious stimuli. The nerves that sense noxious stimuli affecting the body are collectively known as nociceptors and individually are known by the type of stimulus they respond to. Once any sensory nerve, the nociceptor, senses some kind of noxious stimuli, it gets really excited and sends an electrical signal to the spinal cord. At the spinal cord, the nociceptor meets or synapses with another nerve. At this junction, the nociceptor releases a neurotransmitter such as glutamate or substance P, which then, in turn, activates the nerve cell the nociceptor has synapsed with. It's easy to remember that substance P is involved in pain, since you can think of the P as representing the word pain. In any case, the nerve located in the spinal cord then sends a signal to the brain's thalamus, which among other things is a structure in the brain involved in relaying and processing pain sensation. The pain signal that travels to the brain may eventually cause the release of pleasure-producing neurotransmitters, such as endorphins, a type of opioid. These endorphins are released thanks to structures such as the pituitary gland and hypothalamus, the structure in the brain that is responsible for maintaining your body's homeostasis, or normal state of equilibrium. It's not too surprising that most people do not enjoy pain. Even though it is widely known that pain is a, well, painful experience, it is really a way for the body to communicate to you that something is wrong or even dangerous. For example, if you cut your finger or put your hand on a hot stove, pain is what would cause you to quickly move from the source and investigate the problem. So what exactly is pain? Pain is the physical feeling experienced by a person that is caused by disease, injury, or something that hurts the body. Pain can be a dull, achy, sharp, stabbing, shooting, burning, or numb sensation. One person's pain cannot be experienced by another person. For this reason, in the healthcare world, pain can only be described by the person experiencing it. So this means it is happening when they say it is, and to the extent they say it is. While there are many sources of it, pain can be divided into two basic groups. These are nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain occurs when there is tissue damage or injury. Examples of this type of pain include cuts or lacerations and broken bones. Neuropathic pain is caused by damage to nerves. It occurs when there is damage or disease that affects the nervous system. 
Examples of this type of pain include shingles and diabetic neuropathy. In this lesson, you will learn about several different types of pain, including acute, chronic, breakthrough, phantom, and psychogenic pain. Acute pain is directly related to the severity of tissue damage. It lasts no longer than three to six months. This is the type of pain that occurs to warn you that you've experienced an injury or are in danger. For example, if you touch a scorching plate, acute pain is what will tell your hand to quickly move from it. This would be an example of nociceptive acute pain. Surgery is a known cause of neuropathic acute pain due to damage of nerves. Acute pain typically starts suddenly and is short-lived, usually lessening as the injury heals. If you break your leg, the pain may be great at first, but once the injury heals, the pain will be gone. Treatment of acute pain involves treating the source of the pain, such as a burned hand or broken leg. Medications such as narcotics and anti-inflammatories are also used to control pain. Chronic pain can last weeks, months, or even years. Like acute pain, it can be nociceptive or neuropathic. It is diagnosed when pain lasts longer than three to six months. It usually involves a change in the nervous system, making the person experience pain longer or more sensitive to pain. It is typically described as shooting, burning, aching, or electrical. It can range from mild to severe. The cause of chronic pain can be difficult to identify. Some people suffer from chronic pain without past injuries or diseases. Examples of diseases that can cause this type of pain include cancer, fibromyalgia, diabetes, and arthritis. Management of chronic pain is very complex. In general, treatments include medications, physical therapies, and mind-body techniques. It is important to note that an injury that initially causes acute pain can end up causing chronic pain. With acute pain, the pain is a symptom of injured or diseased tissue. When the injury has finished healing, the correlating pain should stop. If the pain continues past a reasonable time period or without cause, it would be considered chronic. An example of this is an injury to the back from a fall or automobile accident. The initial injury causes acute pain. But if pain persists, it can lead to chronic pain. Breakthrough pain is acute pain that breaks through the person's normal pain management. It comes on suddenly and occurs commonly in cancer patients. Most of the time, pain is managed well by medications, but sometimes bouts of severe and sharp pain will still occur. The management of breakthrough pain usually involves narcotics in addition to normal pain medications. Phantom pain feels like it is coming from a body part that has been removed. It was previously believed that this was a psychological issue, but it is now known that these real pain sensations occur in the spinal cord and brain. Phantom pain occurs most often in people who have had an arm or leg amputated. But this disorder can occur with other body parts, such as the breasts, eyes, or tongue. Phantom pain is usually felt on the farthest part of the removed limb, such as the foot of the leg. It is described as shooting, stabbing, boring, squeezing, throbbing, or burning. It usually occurs within a few days of amputation. Psychogenic pain, also known as psychalgia, is physical pain that is caused by mental, emotional, or behavioral factors. It can occur in people with mental disorders, but is more likely to occur after an emotional event. Occurrences such as social rejection, a breakup, job loss, grief, or stress can cause psychogenic pain. 
Examples of this type of pain can include headaches, back pain, or stomach pain. Psychogenic pain is a form of chronic pain. In healthcare, it is sometimes called persistent somatoform pain disorder or functional pain syndrome. Some specialists believe this disorder may help the sufferer to repress dangerous emotions such as anger and rage. Treatments include psychotherapy, antidepressants, analgesics, and other treatments used for chronic pain. Pain is a physical feeling experienced by a person that is caused by disease, injury, or something that hurts the body. Nociceptive pain occurs when there is tissue damage or injury. Examples of this type of pain include cuts or lacerations and broken bones. Neuropathic pain is caused by damage to nerves. It occurs when there is damage or disease that affects the nervous system. Examples of this type of pain include shingles and diabetic neuropathy. Acute pain is directly related to the severity of tissue damage. It lasts no longer than three to six months. This is the type of pain that occurs to warn you that you've experienced an injury or are in danger. Chronic pain can last weeks, months, or even years. Like acute pain, it can be nociceptive or neuropathic. It is diagnosed when pain lasts longer than three to six months. It usually involves a change in the nervous system, making the person experience pain longer or more sensitive to pain. Breakthrough pain is acute pain that breaks through the person's normal pain management. It comes on suddenly and occurs commonly in cancer patients. Phantom pain feels like it is coming from a body part that has been removed. It was previously believed that this was a psychological problem, but it is now known that these real pain sensations occur in the spinal cord and brain. Phantom pain occurs most often in people who have had an arm or leg amputated. But this disorder can occur with other body parts, such as the breasts, eyes, or tongue. Psychogenic pain, also known as psychalgia, is physical pain that is caused by mental, emotional, or behavioral factors. It can occur in people with mental disorders, but is more likely to occur after an emotional event. Occurrences such as social rejection, a breakup, job loss, grief, or stress can cause psychogenic pain. Everyone knows pain is a bad thing, right? Well, actually it is a good thing even though it is a bad or unpleasant feeling. In this lesson, we will discuss gate control theory of pain. But before we do that, you need to have an understanding of what pain is. Pain is an unpleasant feeling that can range from mild to excruciating and is caused by diseased or injured tissues in the body. Dull, achy, sharp, stabbing, shooting, burning, or a numb sensation are some of the words patients use to describe their pain. Since it is impossible for one person to experience another's pain, it can only be described by the person experiencing it. Patients are treated with the assumption that pain is present when they say it is and on the level that they say it is. Although there are many sources and causes of it, pain can be divided into two main groups, nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is the result of tissue damage or injury. Pain from a broken bone, stubbing your toe, or burning your forehead with a curling iron are examples of this type of pain. Neuropathic pain occurs when there is damage or disease that affects the nervous system. Diabetes, limb amputation, and cancer are all conditions that can cause this type of pain. Pain signals are transmitted to the spinal cord and the brain by primary afferent axons, which are nerve fibers that are connected to receptors in the skin, muscles, and organs. 
These axons vary in size and may be myelinated or unmyelinated. Myelin is insulation to nerve fibers that helps transmit pain stimulation quickly. These primary afferent axons are classified into groups based on their size. These groups are known as A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C nerve fibers. All of the A fibers are myelinated, while C fibers are unmyelinated. The thickness of a fiber determines how quickly it transmits information. The thicker the fiber, the faster it can transmit information. The gate control theory of pain was written in 1965 by Patrick Wall, a neuroscientist and professor, and Ronald Melzack, a psychologist and professor. The gate control theory of pain is a scientific theory about the psychological perception of pain. According to the theory, pain is a function of the balance between the information traveling into the spinal cord through large and small nerve fibers. Small nerve fibers carry nociceptive, pain information. Large nerve fibers carry non-nociceptive, do not transmit pain information. Small and large nerve fiber synapse on projection cells, P, to the brain and on inhibitory interneurons, I, with the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The firing of the projection neuron signals pain to be perceived by the brain. The inhibitory interneuron decreases the chances that the projection neuron will fire. Let's break down what the theory is saying step by step. Small and large nerve fibers will remain inactivated without stimulation, and the inhibitory interneuron, I, will block the signal in the projection neuron, P, that connects to the brain. This means the gate is closed and there is no pain. Large nerve fibers are activated with non-painful stimulation. This activates the projection neuron, P, and the inhibitory interneuron, I which blocks a signal in the projection neuron P to the brain. This means the gate is closed and there is no pain. Small nerve fibers are activated with painful stimulation. This activates the projection neurons P and blocks the inhibitory interneuron I. Since the inhibitory interneuron I is blocked, it cannot block the signal from the projection neuron P to the brain. This means the gate is open and there is pain. Not all pain signals are free to reach the brain as soon as they are generated. Pain signals encounter neurological gates at the spinal cord level, and these gates determine whether the pain signal reaches the brain or not. This means that pain is perceived when the gate gives way to strong pain signals, and it is less intense or not perceived at all when the gate closes and makes signals unable to pass. Since not all pain signals are free to reach the brain, the theory provides an explanation as to why a person sometimes finds relief by rubbing or massaging an injured, painful area. Imagine if you hit your head or bumped your funny bone. It would hurt and cause you to feel pain. This would cause nerve fibers a delta and C fiber to open the gate and send the information to the brain that something is causing pain stimulation. By rubbing this area, it is essentially closing the gate to some of this pain stimulation by activating nerve fibers that are even faster than the A delta and C fibers. This overrides the original pain stimulation and gives the area some relief. The gate control theory does not present a complete picture of how the central nervous system processes pain, but it has opened a new dimension on pain perception. This theory has made new pain management strategies possible, such as acupuncture and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS. Let's review. Pain is an unpleasant feeling that can range from mild to excruciating and is caused by diseased or injured tissues in the body. 
dull, achy, sharp, stabbing, shooting, burning, or a numb sensation are some of the words patients use to describe their pain. Nociceptive pain is the result of tissue damage or injury. Pain from a broken bone, stubbing your toe, or burning your forehead with a curling iron are examples of this type of pain. Neuropathic pain occurs when there is damage or disease that affects the nervous system. Diabetes, limb amputation, and cancer are all conditions that can cause this type of pain. Pain is transmitted to the spinal cord and the brain by primary afferent axons, which are nerve fibers that are connected to receptors in the skin, muscles, and organs. Myelin is insulation to nerve fibers that help transmit pain stimulation quickly. The primary afferent axons are classified into groups based on their size. These groups are A-alpha, A-beta, A-delta, and C-nerve fibers. All the A fibers are myelinated, while the C fibers are unmyelinated. The gate control theory of pain is a scientific theory about the psychological perception of pain. According to the theory, pain is a function of the balance between the information traveling into the spinal cord through large and small nerve fibers. Small nerve fibers carry nociceptive pain information, and large nerve fibers carry nonsusceptive, do not transmit pain information. Small and large nerve fibers synapse on projection cells P to the brain and on inhibitory interneurons I with the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The firing of the projection neuron signals pain to be perceived in the brain. The inhibitory interneuron decreases the chances that the projection neuron will fire. Not all pain signals are free to reach the brain as soon as they are generated. Pain signals encounter neurological gates at the spinal cord level, and these gates determine whether the pain signal reaches the brain or not. This means that pain is perceived when the gate gives way to strong pain signals, and it is less intense or not perceived at all when the gate closes and makes signals unable to pass. What is pain? What causes it? Are there different types of pain? These may be some of the questions you have when considering why there is so much variation in how each of us experiences pain. In a very basic definition, pain is an unpleasant sensation and caused by tissue that has either been injured or is diseased. For example, if a guy, let's call him John, stubs his toe on a cement step, this will cause him pain from injured tissue. Likewise, he would also experience pain from diseased tissue if he had rheumatoid arthritis in his hands. One factor that affects our individualized response to pain is that there are different types of pain. Pain is described as nociceptive or non-nociceptive or neuropathic. Nociceptive pain is pain felt in the skin, joints, muscles, ligaments, and organs. This pain is sensed by the stretching, oxygen deprivation, inflammation, and temperature of tissues. A burn or a cut are examples of this type of pain. Non-nociceptive pain is nerve pain from within the nervous system. This pain is sensed from damage to our actual nerves. This can occur from a back injury like a slipped disc or from uncontrolled diabetes causing damage to nerves. Now that you have an understanding of what pain is, we can discuss other factors that affect individual responses to pain, such as duration, threshold, sensory overload, and cultural influences. Acute pain lasts no longer than six months and is related to the severity of an injury. When John stubbed his toe earlier, he was in a lot of pain at first. As the injury begins to heal, the level of pain decreases. Another condition that can cause acute pain is surgery. Acute pain is usually described as sharp, intense, throbbing, or burning. This type of pain can cause an increase in our heart rate and blood pressure. Chronic pain is pain that lasts longer than six months. Diseases such as cancer and diabetic neuropathy can cause chronic pain. People who suffer with chronic pain usually describe it as being uncomfortable, achy feeling, or sore. People have a very wide variation on their pain threshold. Does being male or female have an effect on pain? Statistically, more women report having pain than men. Do men have a higher pain threshold than women? 
This has not been scientifically proven either way. What exactly does pain threshold mean? It is the point that a stimulus, usually associated with pressure or temperature, causes the sensation of pain. This means the person's pain receptors have been stimulated to the point that the person's brain recognizes the sensation of pain somewhere in or on the body. People who have a lower pain threshold will experience pain much quicker than others with a higher threshold. There are several factors that can influence a person's pain threshold. Depression and anxiety can cause a person to have a lower threshold. Athletes usually have higher thresholds than people who do not exercise. Likewise, overweight and obese people report more pain than those at normal weights. Things like genetics and chronic diseases such as diabetes and nerve damage also affect a person's pain threshold. Sensory overload occurs when we receive more information than we are able to process. This can happen from having the TV on while talking with a person, from too much lighting, a noisy environment, large group of people, changes in weather or strong aromas. People who suffer with conditions such as fibromyalgia, FM, and chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, are at risk for also experiencing sensory overload. Sensory overload can make other symptoms worse, including pain. Remember John from earlier in the lesson? Imagine that he is in a really bright room with fluorescent lighting, surrounded by dozens of people, everyone talking, little kids running around, large projection screens playing videos in the background. This is a lot to take in, right? Someone with FM or CFS would probably feel very overwhelmed in this situation, which would cause an increase in their symptoms of fatigue and pain. We've already established that we all experience pain differently. How we express our pain can be divided into two groups, stoic and emotive. People who are stoic are the ones who may be experiencing a great deal of pain, but still they just grin and bear it. People who are emotive are more expressive of the pain they are in and usually look to their family members and loved ones for support during times of pain. To make a very broad generalization of cultures, People from Hispanic, Middle Eastern, and Mediterranean backgrounds are usually emotive, while people from Northern European and Asian backgrounds tend to be stoic. In a very basic definition, pain is an unpleasant sensation and caused by tissue that has either been injured or is diseased. Let's look over the vocabulary we learned that is associated with pain. Nociceptive pain is pain felt in the skin, joints, muscles, ligaments, and organs. Non-nociceptive pain is nerve pain from within the nervous system. Acute pain lasts no longer than six months and is related to the severity of an injury. Chronic pain is pain that lasts longer than six months. Pain threshold is the point that a stimulus, usually associated with pressure or temperature, causes the sensation of pain. Sensory overload occurs when we receive more information than we are able to process. People who are stoic are the ones who may be experiencing a great deal of pain, but they still just grin and bear it. People who are emotive are more expressive of the pain they are in and usually look to their family members and loved ones for support during times of pain. Many people suffer from pain for all sorts of reasons. Broken bones, burns, or stubbing your toe can cause acute pain. Acute pain lasts less than six months and usually reduces as the injury heals. Chronic pain, on the other hand, lasts longer than six months. It can be caused by conditions such as diabetic neuropathy, fibromyalgia, and cancer. Sometimes, though, the cause of pain may not be easily identifiable. This makes treating the pain very difficult. Because some people's pain is hard to relieve, alternative techniques to reduce and treat pain have now become standard methods of treatment. In this lesson, we will discuss several different techniques that are used to help treat pain, such as guided imagery, relaxation, non-narcotic and narcotic analgesics, patient-controlled analgesics, placebos, and cutaneous stimulation. Guided imagery is the process of directing thoughts and imagination into a relaxed, peaceful state of mind. This can be done with an instructor, videos, or written lessons. Guided imagery is based on the belief that the mind and body are connected. The idea is that by imagining places that are safe and comfortable, such as a warm beach or relaxing spa, the body can begin to heal itself. This can help people to be able to control their emotions and improve their overall state of health. 
Guided imagery is used to treat pain management, lower blood pressure, weight loss, and smoking cessation. Much like guided imagery, using relaxation techniques help to reduce stress, which can help to reduce pain. Pain and stress have similar effects on the body. Both will cause the heart rate to increase, blood pressure to rise, breathing rate to increase and become shallow, and cause muscles to tense and contract. This is very taxing to the body and can lead to major consequences to one's health. Practicing relaxation exercises helps to calm the mind, release tension in muscles, reduce stress hormones, and improve overall health. All of these benefits on the body can help to reduce pain. Some people turn to music, prayer, gardening, reading, conversation with loved ones, or exercise to help them relax. Other options include deep breathing, hypnosis, and meditation. Non-narcotic analgesics are medications used to treat mild to moderate pain and inflammation. These medications are useful to alleviate headaches and sore muscles. They are available over-the-counter, OTC, without prescription. They are taken by mouth. They can be taken in conjunction with other pain management therapies or medications for severe pain. Common non-narcotic analgesics include Tylenol, Ibuprofen, and Naproxen. Ibuprofen and naproxen are NSAIDs. This means non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Narcotic analgesics, or opioids, are prescribed medications for severe pain. Narcotics bind to opioid receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and other areas of the body. This reduces pain messages being sent to the brain and therefore reduces the feeling of pain. Narcotics do not remove the pain, they dissociate people's feeling of pain. Narcotics are usually given after surgery and with certain diseases, such as cancer. Common narcotic analgesics include morphine, oxycodone, and fentanyl. Patient-controlled analgesics, or PCA, is a method of pain management in which the patient is given the power to administer pain medication, usually narcotics, when it is needed. With PCAs, a computerized pump with pain medication is attached intravenously, IV, to the patient. The patient is given a button they can push when they need a dose of medicine for their pain. Sometimes the pump is programmed to give a small amount of pain medication continuously in addition to having the button for additional pain medicine. The pump is programmed with a maximum dose that is allowed to be administered. This is to protect the patient from overdosing on the medication. A placebo is a treatment that seems to be real but is in fact fake. It can be in the form of a pill, injection, or other treatment. Placebos are helpful to researchers to determine the effects and side effects of new medications in trials where participants are blindly given either the new medication or the placebo. Some people can knowingly take a placebo and still experience an effect from it. This effect can be positive or negative. Some people experience improvements to conditions they have. This is called the placebo effect. It is believed that this happens due to the mind-body relationship. The person takes a pill, believing the pill will have an effect on them, and this causes the person to have symptom improvement. The placebo effect has been shown to have symptom improvement for individuals with depression, pain management, sleep disorders, menopause, and irritable bowel syndrome. Cutaneous stimulation are techniques and treatments that stimulate the skin to help patients refocus their attention from painful sensations. Techniques include the use of hot or cold compresses, massage, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS, acupressure, and contralateral stimulation. Heat helps soothe back and joint pain, while ice helps to reduce inflammation and swelling. Massage helps to promote relaxation and comfort and therefore reduces pain. TENS uses applied electrodes to the skin to deliver an electric current over areas of pain. This produces a tingling sensation and helps patients to have diminished pain perception. Acupressure is the application of pressure to certain nerve pathways of the body in an effort to reduce pain signals to the brain. Contralateral stimulation is the stimulation of the opposite area of a painful area of the body. An example of this could be massaging the right ankle when the left ankle is broken or strained. Acute pain lasts less than six months and usually reduces as the injury heals. Chronic pain, on the other hand, lasts longer than six months. The reason some people experience pain, especially chronic pain, is sometimes difficult to identify. 
This also makes it difficult to treat. Because of this, alternative treatments are now commonly used to treat pain. Guided imagery is the process of directing thoughts and imagination into a relaxed, peaceful state of mind. This can be done with an instructor, videos, or written lessons. Guided imagery is based on the belief that the mind and body are connected. Relaxation techniques help to reduce stress, which can help to reduce pain. Practicing relaxation exercises helps to calm the mind, release tension in muscles, reduce stress hormones, and improve overall health. All of these benefits on the body can help to reduce pain. Non-narcotic analgesics are medications used to treat mild to moderate pain and inflammation. They are available over-the-counter, OTC, without prescription. Common non-narcotic analgesics include Tylenol, Ibuprofen, and Naproxen. Narcotic analgesics, or opioids, are prescribed medications for severe pain. Narcotics bind to opioid receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and other areas of the body. This reduces pain messages being sent to the brain and therefore reduces the feeling of pain. Common narcotic analgesics include morphine, oxycodone, and fentanyl. Patient-controlled analgesics, or PCA, is a method of pain management in which the patient is given the power to administer pain medication, usually narcotics, when it is needed. With PCAs, a computerized pump with pain medication is attached intravenously, IV, to the patient. The patient is given a button they can push when they need a dose of medicine for their pain. A placebo is a treatment that seems to be real but is in fact fake. It can be in the form of a pill, injection, or other treatment. Some people experience improvements to conditions they have when they knowingly take placebos. This is called the placebo effect. It is believed that this happens due to the mind-body relationship. Cutaneous stimulation are techniques and treatments that stimulate the skin to help patients refocus their attention from painful sensations. Techniques include the use of hot or cold compresses, massage, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, acupressure, and contralateral stimulation. Fluid is very important to have in our bodies. It makes up the blood that transports oxygen and nutrients to organs, hydrates our tissues, and carries waste products outside our body when we urinate, breathe, and sweat. In order to stay healthy, you must have the right amount of fluid in your body. When a person has too much fluid, the condition is called fluid volume excess. Think about how a dry sponge looks in its original shape compared to when it's filled with water. Just like the sponge, people who have fluid volume excess look swollen and puffy. This is because the excess fluid in their bodies has leaked into the tissues right beneath the skin. The medical term edema describes this appearance. You commonly see this in the legs, ankles, and feet. However, it can appear anywhere there is tissue, such as the arms, abdomen, face, and around the eyes. In some cases, a person may have a form of edema called pitting edema. This occurs when the body part is so full of fluid, you can press your fingertips into the skin and make indentations that slowly disappear. Sometimes, the skin is extremely stretched to where it appears shiny. There can also be excess fluid in the abdomen that makes it look round and protruded. This is called distension. Just like a water-filled sponge, the skin feels squishy. In severe situations, the skin feels moist or wet from the fluid leaking out. When feeling the pulse in the wrist, it can feel very strong and forceful, which is called a bounding pulse. The person may complain about a heaviness in his or her body, particularly in the chest, arms, and legs. Other complaints include headache, difficulty breathing, heart palpitations, fatigue, and confusion. A stethoscope is used to listen to the heart and lungs. When there is excess fluid in the body, these organs can sound a specific way. The heart may beat with an irregular rhythm or faster than normal tachycardia. The lungs may have a rattling sound when inhaling and exhaling, called rails or crackles. As a nurse, it is important to identify fluid volume excess so that specific interventions can be performed. Like any fluid, the fluid in the body has weight. The nurse weighs the patient every day at the same time, usually in the morning. The patient should have on the same amount of clothes when weighed on a standing scale or covers removed when weighed on a bed scale. A weight measurement is a good indicator of how much fluid is in the body when comparing the readings from day to day.
Nurses measure the amount of fluids going in and out of the body over a period of time. The intake includes the fluid that goes into the body. Here are some examples. Beverages, water, juice, milk, soda, coffee, and tea. Liquid foods, broth, and soup. Foods that become liquid at room temperature. Ice chips, ice cream, gelatin, and popsicles. Fluids received through an intravenous line, saline, multivitamins, and blood transfusion. And nutritional supplements received through a feeding tube. The output is the fluid that goes out of the body. Urine is the most common type of output the nurse measures. Other examples are the fluids from vomiting, diarrhea, and bleeding. Excess fluid in the body can gather in the arms and legs and lead to edema when the limbs are in downward positions. Positioning the limbs above the heart facilitates fluid circulation back into the body. If the patient is in bed, the foot of the bed can be elevated to help relieve fluid from the legs and feet while pillows are used to elevate the arms. The nurse might also encourage walking around, since moving the legs moves fluid from the lower limbs. Water likes to go where there is sodium, so when there are elevated levels of sodium in the body, it holds on to water, leading to excess fluid. To help prevent this, the nurse can encourage the patient to avoid foods that contain high amounts of salt, such as those that are fried, processed, packaged, and canned. There are special medications called water pills or diuretics that help rid the body of excess fluid. Diuretics work by making the kidneys put more sodium into the urine. These can be taken orally, though in severe cases of fluid volume excess, they are given intravenously. As you've learned already, water likes to go where sodium is located, so it also goes into the urine. One way the nurse checks to see that diuretics are working is by observing an increased amount of urine the patient puts out. The nurse should also monitor the side effects of the diuretics, because some can cause dizziness, low potassium levels, and a sudden drop in blood pressure. Fluid volume excess is when the body has too much fluid in the body. There are many symptoms people can experience. The skin is often swollen, puffy, moist, and shiny. The abdomen can look distended. The person can have a bounding pulse, feel heaviness in the body, or complain of difficulty breathing, heart palpitations, fatigue, and confusion. Rattling sounds may be heard in the lungs. Specific nursing interventions include taking the patient's weight every day to determine the amount of excess fluid in the body, monitoring intake and output of fluids, positioning the body to facilitate the draining of fluids, encouraging a low-sodium diet, and administering diuretics.